Edgar um, on? I don't know. I don't see him in the list. He might be trying to figure out how to get on. You want to give him one minute or you want to begin? No, you can wait. All right, let's give him about two minutes because he might be trying to um, download this app to get on. He's fully aware of his appointment, isn't he, Jeff? Yes, he is. And he acknowledged receipt of the uh, invite for the meeting. Okay. Oh, he did. Well, I think we should begin. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Good morning Gerald. On opening up under open forum. I first want to put on the record, I want to thank Frank Carmen for all his service that he's done on this board. And um, all the contributions that he's uh, done to this state. So I just want to put that on record under open forum. And I want to also welcome Edward Edgar Rodriguez to our board. Anybody think else have anything to bring under open forum? Yes, I'd like to actually fill the request to have the position filled. So, Dan, could you have um, could you have your friend fill out an application? Yes, I'll uh, I'll speak with them again. I know that there was an application, and I personally spoke with boards and commissions, and they said that they were considering someone else at that time, but that's back when, you know. But I, I'll I'll. Again, uh, give a call. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. All right, under minutes, um, the approval for our last meeting on December 14th, 2021. What do I hear? Is there any corrections or do we accept these minutes? So moved. Second. Questions? Hi, All in favor? Hi. Party me. All right. Hey, Bob. How are you? Um, now, is, this one, is I have one quick objecting question. to the minutes or somebody trying to correct something? All right. No, I, I think was, that was just background noise. All right. Thank you very much. This one quick question that I have, um, uh, Frank uh, Mana, or if you notice, we have the Connecticut Public. Um, health systems or practitioners and bombers that give practical exams. That's on our list. We still have under Howard K. Hill, uh, Mr. Brown, who passed away. So that needs to be taken off. Jerry passed. If you look at hey, that morning. Page, I... Good morning, everyone. everyone. Good morning, Edgar. Good morning, Frank. Yeah, how are you? Good morning, everyone. Nice hey, to see morning. you, Mr. Jowdy. Thank you, Mr. Miner. Nice to see you. Um, yeah, I had that list updated, so we do have a copy. I just sent Jeff a, a current copy. Uh, Mr. Gomes has been added to the listing as well. That's right. Okay. All right, that's cool. Frank, the, a right, question so for you. The, the current list that you've just issued, all of them have uh, given you an, a green light that they're still willing to participate? No one has emailed me otherwise. Uh, okay, because I know I've had several people have called me for practicals and have told me that they've called the list and a couple of them had said 
that they were no longer interested in doing them. God, do you don't have any uh, the specific names? I didn't get any specific names from from the individuals. It seemed to me like they were a few of the old timers. But I'll look at the list again, and see if I yeah. can. Yeah, you know, if you could uh, find you know that information and just have them email me, we'll, we'll update it again. I so will. Need it. Thank you. Thank you. Frank, we, are you in with the meeting today? Are you you watching the meeting from your screen? Oh yeah, right now. Yeah. Okay, because I have a couple of questions for for clarification. Through the chair, can I ask Mr. Mana? You can. Without, yeah, I was just about to bring the, anybody from the health department. Thank you. Bring anybody, you can. The uh, a couple of. Um, apprentices to be called me and asked me about the amount of time that they would have left to serve their apprenticeship once they were given their apprenticeship card was it is it nine months or 12 months because one claimed that the three months was shaved off of the 12. well we'll put it to the one year uh, you know I'll still allocate it for one year, even if they did the pre-grad training. The one year so, I'll still reflect on the card. Okay, so so, so you know, it, have them you know uh, coincide with me. That sometimes um, you know they're going in between, and there's a break in between. Mm -hmm. uh, so they should notify us when they leave uh, a funeral employment, uh, funeral um, embalmer, you know. Uh, attachment to an employment, they should notify us because they'd have to fill out a new apprentice application. Okay, and that, that permit has to be uh, void, expired, so they can start a new one. Sure, well, I, I had one call me and ask me if he was to serve 12 months or nine months because he did his three months up front. Yeah, if he's doing his pre-grad training, then it'll do his nine months, and uh, the card may reflect it the, the one year, but he would do his nine months. As long okay. as we have verification of certification of uh, three months pre-grad training. And the 10 embalmings previous, it comes off the 50? As long as, well, no, I mean, you have to do your 50 embalming. Exactly. In the one year apprenticeship. You can't do All that right. on a pre-grad training. So the pre-grad training, the 10 for pre-grad will not come off the 50? No, no. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. You're welcome. Thank you. Who's going to be? Is there anybody um, that's going to address the board this morning from the health department about the number of cases or new uh, funeral homes that need to be licensed? Uh, I don't know if uh, Mr. Benkowski is logged on. I haven't uh, had a chance to speak to him. I don't know. I'm, I, I'm not here. I'm here. I think. Oh, he's here. He's here. What are you talking, Daryl? How many funeral homes closed and new ones? Yes. I have no new applications for no, any funeral homes on my desk at this time. Okay. As far as closings go, I have I haven't done a closing in probably. I can tell you. Three months. Okay, um, I will let you know a new manager record came on board. Um, Gary Baxter Jr. took over since his father passed away. So he's the new manager of the Baxter funeral home, Dylan Baxter in Hartford or Weathersfield. He's the embalmer record and manager record. Um, Prospect Memorial, um, Kimberly Palmieri became the manager record. And embalmer record for there too. Yeah, like I said, I have n nothing on my desk for new funeral homes opening or anything else. Or well, one's trying to get another license out of a location, Daryl. All right. So well, well, there's going to be a one. I'm going to. I need to get. Uh, and I call you, Frank. I need to get a copy. I need to get an application for a, a license for a new funeral home. I, I will send you one, Daryl. That comes through me. Okay. 
All right, yes, yeah, okay. send me one, and then I'll call you and give you the preliminaries about it. Yep, okay. Okay. I think we should pause and welcome Edgar. Yes, Edgar, welcome to the board. Good morning. Thank you. My apologies for the delay. Um, unfortunately, I didn't realize I didn't have Microsoft Teams on my system, so. Yeah, I sort of I said that. <laughs> Hello, Edgar, my name's Agnes Pierre. Nice to meet you. Pleasure meeting you, pleasure meeting you. Thank you so much. We've noted it in your record book that you're late at your first meeting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> okay, uh, this is Jeff. I'm going to give you an update on some investigations uh, that I got from our licensing investigation practitioner investigation unit. There are currently 22 uh, funeral home cases that are under investigation and 24 cases involving involving embalmers. Okay. And probably yes, Mr. You know, Mr. Mr. Binkowski might have more information as to the types of cases that that are uh, pending. Uh, I'm sure they're probably the uh, the usual. Okay. Yeah, they're usually, and um, they're usual cases. Um, they're still going forward. I mean, I'll say this: um, legal compliance office is rather slow these days. So that's all I. Can they're over there. Okay. Rob, those, um, Mr. Binkowski, those those cases about how people were embalming bodies, complaints from families, it really doesn't have, that's what they're involving them bombers. Some of them are, um, I'll just say some are loss of jewelry, some are pre need, some are um, making people buy casket during COVID. Okay. Those things. Not filing our death certificates for six months. Body in the cooler for 90 days. Okay. Okay. All righty. Um, under old business, the, the Catholic uh, funeral plan, do we have any updates with that? I had found out that the Catholic funeral plan is not under the archdiocese. It's actually run, um, the whole plan is being run from the Catholic Cemeteries Association. And according to the information I've received, the Catholic Cemeteries Association is basically going out to various Catholic cemeteries that are having struggles and buying those up. Um, St. Joseph's in Windsor is not one of them and they are not part of the Catholic Cemeteries Association. It is affiliated with the Archdiocese, but is not part of the Archdiocese. It is a separate nonprofit organization. I can send you all the um, link to its website. That's the information I've gotten. And they're putting out a big push right now to get people to buy crypts. You can hear it all over the radio. Does anyone have anything else to bring on that? So they're in, in theory, what they're trying to do is, is sell off some of their their plots and their crypts on a yep. pre need basis, which obviously has always been, you know, a practice that they've done for years. Um, the question we originally had was whether or not they were legally allowed to sell funeral supplies. Um, or sell pre need. And I think um, the question would have to be raised with the state insurance commissioner if, if in fact, that they are, you know, allowed to sell the uh, program as they set forth. Um, I know the question came up about, you know, who has the right to sell funeral supplies. And obviously we thought we would single out this particular circumstance, but after careful thought, I'm saying to myself, 
Well, they're not the only ones on the big big picture selling funeral supplies. We would have to initiate some type of legislation to prohibit any and all entities from selling funeral supplies um, or goods and services except licensed funeral directors because we would be, you know, fighting the big box stores that sell caskets and urns. And we would be fighting Amazon who sells funeral supplies online, you know, and, and that would be a major task to uh, prohibit those organizations from coming into the state and selling. That is true. Now, um, if the truth be told, you know, um, unless someone actually takes up this here fight, this is a fight that's going to be hard to try to um, combat. Mm -hmm. Well, I agree with you in, in fighting off who sells funeral supplies. You are going to be fighting off the big box stores. Yeah. Um, the other question, and, and Amazon included, um, whether or not the this Catholic affiliation is is legal to sell what they're selling, I think a, the question would need to be raised with the not the Department of Public Health, but with the state insurance commissioners or consumer protection to find out if you know it, it is proper or not. I mean, as a board, do we want to ask? the state and com insurance commissioner uh, opinion of the the action we could it's up to the it's up to the um it's up to the board but we just got to realize that the i don't want to say the can of worms we're opening up but you know i'm 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 down for whatever the board wants to do what you're talking about is the catholic cemetery Association, which is a nonprofit, and so right. it files for 990 as a nonprofit. Um, you know, they're probably going to come back and say, "Well, we aren't going to, we aren't profiting from selling the supplies. We're doing it for the betterment of the Catholics in the area." You know, whether it's worth it or not, is it worth the fight? I don't necessarily know whether it's worth the fight or not. I don't think it would be necessarily a fight just to get an opinion whether they're acting properly or, or or not. Then the question goes to Jeff. Jeff, do we ask yeah. you to submit the question to the insurance commission? Uh, I think you're going to have to put the question in writing and then Oops, sorry about that. You put the question in writing, send it to me through Daryl, and we can uh, forward it on. And I, at, at the end of the last meeting when Frank was a member, I, I we were going to do that. And no one, I got you the information and no one got me any information back so I could write the letter. So I can't write the letter. I, I am a member of the public and a former town clerk. So I don't know the intricacies. Um, so I don't think I'm an appropriate person to write the letter. What's the opinion of counsel there? Good morning. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Yeah, Good morning to, re to re refresh what happened last time. And it's, I thought, um, Agnes, you were just going to, not, not just, but you were going to be like the person who pulled it all together once they gave you the facts. And That's right. Actually, no one got me any facts. I would have been more than willing to send the facts out. I sent out two mails two emails out and no one got me any facts and then guess what holidays came and trips came and da 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 I think the uh, basic question we have here is whether or not they have the legal right to offer to the general public the pre-need 
uh, funding of funerals as they present them to the people. I mean, basically, I, I you know, heard one gentleman speak and basically what he was speaking about was that they were going to um, sell a pre-need program through insurance and they in turn would then place the, the, the premium with a bona fide insurance agency or, or insurance company and then at the time of the passing of the individual the family would then notify the insurance company or or the program carrier and they in turn were going to say okay when you go and, and sit with edgar or if you go and sit with with daryl just let either one of them know that they're to contact us and we will give them the application to file for the funds from the insurance company so it looks like that basically what the connecticut uh, cemetery association is doing is they're getting the commission for using their name to sell the pre-need life insurance just as if we ourselves if we had insurance as a vehicle to fund pre-need that the funeral home and or the funeral director would receive a commission say from whomever forethought back when or whenever so i think this is exactly what's going on whether or not uh, they're entitled to the commission um, constitutes whether or not they in fact um, have an insurance license or they're just basically receiving compensation for using their name. And is that is that proper? That's true. So well, I remember I think back. It sounds like you, you have uh, a twofold issue with the insurance department and if there are any complaints it would be with consumer protection so i just sent all i just sent everyone that was on the email for this meeting the link from the catholic cemeteries association pre-planning page and it basically details very much what you've said dan correct so so i don't know if basically do you feel that their advertisement is misleading? Do they have a legal right to do it? That's the question. Do they have a re legal right to do pre-planning and to accept the insurance bond? That's what it is. Well, the, the question- and They're probably I, making a commission off of that in the end. My question would be, you know, are they legally entitled to sponsor a program such as that and to receive a commission right a funeral home a funeral director was allowed to receive a commission because a the funeral director wrote the plan um, was licensed by the state insurance commission now i don't know you know just because the people are, are being gathered up in the name of the the Catholic Diocese, the Archdiocese of Hartford into a into a room and you've got a pre-need specialist there and he's selling a plan just like um, Dignity sells the plans for, at their funeral homes. Um, is this, and we know Dignity is licensed, is, you know, is Department of Consumer Protection comfortable with having, you know, something like this out there in fear of maybe a, a loophole I mean, if we do something wrong, there's recourse. They go into the Department of Public Health or they go to Consumer Protection or they go to Insurance Commission. Do these people know where they may go if they have a complaint against this company that's selling this program? Probably not. And if you call your local pastor, you know what he's gonna tell you. I don't know much about it, call the diocese. And you know what, you're gonna call the diocese and. They're going to say hello. How are you? Thank you for calling. We'll get back to you. Yeah, what actually I asked father about that. What happens is if someone calls the if someone calls their the parish and says, you know, they they saw this pre planning thing, they want to do it. What they're given is they're given the telephone of the Catholic Cemeteries Association 
and someone there approaches them. That's what happens. So they have a sales representative sell the program to the individual person and and somehow they split the commission from the insurance company that's, that's underwriting it. And from what I understand initially, and maybe Mr. Binkowski might be if he's still here, the speculation was at one time that it may have been Forthoff. Or, wow. or the, I will say this, Dan, the piece of paper I received from the Catholic, saying the Catholic funeral plan, it says, and I'll, it is a life insurance agency, and agents are listed to sell life insurance. And right in the back, it says through the forethought plan. That's what it says. Forethought Life Insurance Company. So forethought obviously is giving giving either the Catholic Church or or splitting the commission between the person who's writing it and the host. But it is a licensed insurance agent that's that is writing the plan on behalf of the church. Is that how you see it, Rob? I just, I, I, I'll just read what it says. The Catholic funeral plan is funded through an insurance policy underwritten by Forethought Life Insurance Company. Okay, and that's what it says right on the back of this thing. And it says Catholic Family Service Association, 70 Middletown Avenue, North Haven, Connecticut. And the form I got, it was January of 2021. Mm hmm. And it, has so I'm not sure. and it does have catholicfuneralplan.com on it. But yep, it does that, say, yep. So it seems like definitely we know forethought would pay off a commission as soon as the plan is initiated. And where is that commission going? Is it being split by the, the agent in the diocese for endorsing it? or is the agent getting some and the diocese getting some for endorsement? But I'm sure, I'm sure that the plan would not be um, bannered by the Catholic Church if the Catholic Church was not receiving some compensation. From what I understood, that was where the Catholic Cemeteries Association comes in. So they get a compensation for that. Sure, sure. For they're promoting looking, it. It's 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 their vehicle through promoting it to uh, gain income. Yes, absolutely. Whether they're whether they're entitled to the compensation, I don't know if that's legal or illegal. I wouldn't have any idea about that. You know, because right. they're endorsing endorsing a company to promote pre need. Are they entitled to that compensation or do they hold a license for it? I'm not sure. I, I maybe council can give us some oversight on that or we, we go to the insurance commission or Department of Consumer Protection to say, you know, these people need to know you know, basically you need to look at it because if there's a flaw in this, where do they go? Would you mind if I ask the question? Um, I can mute it myself. Uh, um, I can't give you an answer without doing some research. So if you can provide me with, um, Bob, Bob, if you can provide me what you just read and Agnes, whatever you have, you can send it to Jeff and he'll send it to me. I will. I, I really don't know. It does sound like it's an insurance department um, jurisdiction, but I, we might have some issue with it. Go ahead, Agnes. Yeah, I, it, it's called the Catholic Funeral Plan. Yeah, and I will send you an affordable assurance inflation protection thing. I will send the, uh, the faith-based pre-need plan for you and your loved ones. I will send you this um, form 
Okay. Um, it's so a nice, it's a link. It's a, okay. it's a link. You can open it up and you can see it. And it's from the um, Catholic Cemeteries Association that's doing it in light, you know. And I'm sure the reason why they're doing it is because they can make some money off of it, which is perfectly fine if that's legal. If they're licensed from, then that's fine. It's not a problem. But I can send that to you, Alfreda, so you can advise us. And then it, um, Jeff does just simply take an email to you saying, would you please look into the, would you please forward this to the insurance department to ask them to, um, for, is that, is that all it takes or does it take a formal letter? I think it'll need a formal letter um, and probably it's really best from uh, DPH investigation unit to uh, forward that to the insurance department so uh, their investigators can look into it. All right, well, wait, then it seems Dan and Ed, Edgar and Daryl, doesn't it look like Alfred is going to advise us and then we can decide what we want to do next time. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. It does. The question will be, when is Elfrida retiring? <laughs> I didn't mention it. Did somebody tell you something that I don't know? <laughs> you should be asking Jeffrey. Well, I know yeah. Jeffrey is going off on April Fool's Day. Yeah. Are well, you retiring, Jeff? Uh, yeah, I think I'm going to call it quits. He's, he's been and a half years. <laughs> He's been threatening this for every month for how many years, but I think this time he means it. But your next meeting I is June 9th. I'll, I'll still be here. Okay. For a little while. I'll try when to you retire. Um, July 1. Hopefully Jeff will pull a Gary Griffin. <laughs> he might, I don't know. But retire for a day and come back. I think it's you have to be gone for um at least a month. But you know, I haven't looked into that because I don't think I'll be doing that, but I think it's at least a month. So um, I will try to do the research on this and have it all prepared for, if not by your next meeting. Mr. It, Chairman, I, I don't think it's within our jurisdiction to begin with, but I think yeah. that's a good idea that the investigations should look into it. But they're probably saying they already have a lot of on their plate pending investigation, but we'll see what we can get done. And it could, um, it could be that they're totally licensed and it's not an issue. Mm -hmm, correct. I'll send you the thing from the Cemetery Association. They detail it out in as, as you know, in fairly clear language. You know, and, and sure, it's generalizations. Doesn't get into the. It doesn't have the fine print on it yet. OK. I, I think one of the questions that I'd, I'd be curious to find out is, um, yes, they, they they can sell whatever they want, but up to a certain point, what guarantees are they making to these families that they're selling these plans to who will in turn, um, when they come to a funeral home or, or come to a provider of services, um, how much of that is going to make us as funeral homes going to make us look bad in a sense because we're not meeting the expectations that they guaranteed these families in a sense um so i think that's just a concern that the consumer would they be confused as to why their plans are not meeting the expectations that they were told they're going to meet possibly because it's kind of a little difficult to be promising i mean again i i'm just coming into this for what i'm hearing but it's kind of difficult to be promising or guaranteeing certain things through a plan that they have no control over to execute in the end, only the cemetery part of it. That's right. You're so right. I'll, <laughs> when I it. send it to Alfreda, I'll also send it to the three of you so that you could see it. Yeah, it's very similar to the to the Lincoln Heritage Life and um, Funeral yes, right. I saw. Exactly. Um, I just had one yesterday and. They sold the policy to this lady for fourteen thousand four hundred seventy-six dollars. I mean, to a T. And I said fourteen thousand four hundred seventy-six dollars. Where did they come up with that number? 
And it was written by an insurance agent. But my question is, where do they come up with these numbers to determine it's $14,476, which it did not even get to that point. So well, I, and then the I person shed a little assistance. light on that, Edgar. Mm -hmm. There was a group that came around all the funeral homes in the area and asked for general priceless, casket priceless, and vault priceless. And they have them. And when they sit down with people and they ask what funeral home you're going to be doing business with potentially, and they name the funeral home and they'll come out and say, well, here's the general price list and let's let's figure out what you're going to need for insurance. Right. And, and I can I can understand part of that, but that's very difficult to determine to a consumer what oh, absolutely. The cost of their funeral is going to be in 10 years because for example we're all experiencing this level of inflation that we're experiencing now that in the in, in the turn of things if we're experiencing on our side who in turn the gets that hit the consumer well so my, my big where do you put your pre-need funds well in my case i i use access i don't use insurance okay personally. you use access daryl um i use the what's that company um Mannix? No, it's right up in, Can oh my God. Oh, the Connecticut one? The one that's in Connecticut? Cooperative. 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 Up in Madison. Yeah, you go away. I was, I was just as a sidebar, not to, to, you know, go any further. I was, I was hoping that we could encourage our companies, both Access and Cooperative, to combat that ad by saying, this is what you would get from insurance 10 years from now. And this is what you would get from us if you put it in a trust 10 years from now. Now I've had some that initially I wrote with forethought back when that I'll tell you that, you know, we're gonna have to modify some, some decisions that this family's gonna make because the forethought life insurance did not keep up with inflation. Now, I also place money with fourth uh, with a cooperative at the same time. And this particular same sum of money is doubled now. And right. and truthfully, that's what this family's going to need to exercise exactly what they wanted when they wrote this 20 years ago. So yeah, I, I love I'm just thinking that, yeah. you know, I don't know why, not not because it would come from the board, it's just coming from funeral directors who do business with with trust companies to tell them, hey, come on back at us, come help us and fight off these people who are selling this insurance. Because we know that the with the commissions that they're gonna pay up front penalizes the families and the very end when they need the money. Mm -hmm. That's why I refuse insurance because I mean, automatically putting in putting in a uh, uh, life insurance policy and getting eight hundred dollars in your pocket for writing it. Well, you know that family's not going to get that eight hundred bucks. And yes, it looks good. The kids can go on vacation, you know. But in the meantime, when your family comes back to you in ten or twelve years and you say to them. Well, we're going to have to modify mother's arrangements because the insurance didn't pay exactly what a trust would. You know, who's who's wearing the egg now on on their shirt? So I've been hoping that trust companies might combat that insurance uh, vehicle and stand right out there and say, you know, your funeral directors that sell trust companies trust, you know, will you'll benefit better by going to a funeral home that put your money into a trust versus insurance. You know, that's that's just kind of conversation amongst ourselves. Yeah, I definitely agree because I love cooperative and their 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 rate of return, you can't beat that. No, it's it's still scratching about three mm percent. -hmm. I, I have actually a, a curious thing that I just thought I'd share with you guys that I found out literally about a month ago between cooperative and access. And as as I'm I'm not even sure if the state understands this, but Cooperative both place money in trust accounts. But what I found curious, and the only reason I found this out is because one of my families wanted direct deposit from their um, bank account into their trust account. 
And, and when I asked Access if that's something that they would do, they said that they are not allowed to do it. Because, and they are not allowed to do it because the federal government is, that's one of their requirements and they are inspected or audited by the federal government yearly, yet cooperative falls under another level where they are not audited. And that's the only reason I never switched to cooperative locally because I said, well, I prefer locally, you know, that, that way it's a company in Connecticut. But when I found that out, I found that quite curious and I'm not understanding why one would be audited and the other one's not if they're both in trust accounts. Well, from what I understand, in, in years past, I believe the Victor Chigas from Access out in Chicago would pay to be self-audited to present an audited report to the states that he, in fact, represents. Okay. Okay. All right. I, I, I don't know, you know, again, I don't know how they ended up getting audited, but I know that they get audited yearly for whatever reason. If it's their own doing, that's great. But I, he, they made it seem to us like it was all requirement, but that they were not, that that the, any, the, some other companies were not required. And I was like, oh, okay. But I found it kind of weird, but. So the, the, the thing with access was that they were giving, and still do, I believe, um, the Connecticut Funeral Directors Association a commission for their endorsement. Oh. Okay. So, um, you know, it, it's... You're going, go, but just going back to the Catholic um, funeral plan, just one last question on that. Um, and I agree with with with, with Alfreda. Um, I think definitely it's 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 a double it's a consumer issue on two two levels also. And I did uh, file initially a concern with the AG's office because I'm personally curious as to know, on top of this funeral plan, why their pricing structure is so high compared to other cemeteries. If all these cemeteries are not for profit including their charging a road tax for a non-taxable entity or non-taxable land. And, and it falls into the consumer. You see what I mean? So I, I find it very awkward how these charges are so exorbitant compared to other cemeteries and they're all non-for-profit. Or supposed to be. And that's what I find intriguing. Or, and, and don't get me wrong, listen, everybody has the right to charge whatever they feel that it's appropriate that they need to charge. But I do feel that families rely on us as funeral directors and as, as, as for example, as a board to, to keep an eye peeled for what doesn't seem right. And, and I think in a sense that that restores the integrity of what people believe that we are doing for them. Because, you know, they come to us at one of their most vulnerable stages and it's not, I just, I, I don't know about you guys, but I swallow deep and I feel a family like the other day for two pieces, they ended up paying $9,800. Edgar, what I'm thinking is most non for profit um, is something has to do with tax too. At the end of the year, most of these non for profit organizations, if they have any um, profits that's left over to the book, they can donate 70 to 80% of that to another organization. So normally, I'm not saying this just for an example. The uh, Catholic um, cemeteries, if they have a profit at the end, they'll probably donate that money right to the Catholic Church at the end of the year under their non for profit. So um, they're probably trying to make as much as they can to try to make sure that their organization sustains through, um, you know, through time. And their prices are really, um, they're exorbitant. But, you know, if you, you know, I, I say, I, I sort of agree with you, but it's a, um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a tall hill to climb to be able to um, try to change their price structure. Well, and the other thing is if what they're trying to do is preserve Catholic cemeteries and Catholic cemeteries yes. are struggling, just like everything else is struggling. They're looking, they may be very well looking to 
bolster their income so that they can then go and buy these cemeteries from the ailing parishes that they're associated with. Because back in the day, uh, most Catholic cemeteries, you have to show um, your certificate that you were baptized in the church in order to be um, buried in the cemetery or use their mausoleums. Because there, anybody technically now can use a Catholic cemetery for burial. Long as you have the money, you have a grave. So I guess because of their financial situation, they changed. You know, they had to bend on some of their uh, misbehavior. Their structure. Yeah. Um, I like that word, misbehaviors. Years yeah. back, they wouldn't allow a funeral to go through their gates unless there was a man or woman of the cloth bringing the funeral in with them. I can remember that going back. Um, but I do understand that any of the profits that are derived from the Diocese of Bridgeport obviously is, is trying to replace the funds that they exhausted for the legal affairs um, and also to fund the priest pension fund. Now, so of course, I don't think there's many clergy that would be willing to Buck the bishop's fee schedule, knowing that it reflects their eventual pension. But I will say this: I will, I will tip my hat to the diocese of Bridgeport, only because I've had several families who were less fortunate, and I called their local pastors and told the pastor what I was working with, and they in turn called the bishop, and the bishop again gave them a break on the charges of the cemetery. The bishop said to me on the phone, nobody's going to be denied burial. If you have a circumstance such as that you truthfully know that you have a family that's that is less fortunate, I want you to call the pastor of the, the church that these people go to and have the pastor call me and we'll work something out. Dan, my faith in humanity has been installed. It has been restored for today. Thank you. <laughs> for the moment. Before we but you can use an egg timer on that. I know. I know. And coming Mr. from a bishop. Whoa. Mr. Jody. Anyways, so where we're going from here is i'm going to send the um, website information to the four of you um so that alfreda can come back and actually give us an idea of what we're going to do and then we'll see if we can put a formal letter together if we feel it's needed to be forwarded to the insurance company the insurance okay. commission did I hear my name called? Yeah, Mr. Jowdy, getting back to getting back to um, the tenant bombings. Yes. For a student registered student that did go through last year under Section 2212. It's um, it's a, a revision to the section of the statutes that nothing in this chapter shall be constructed to prohibit a student who is enrolled in a program of education and mortuary science approved by the board with the consent of the commissioner of public health from embalming up to 10 human bodies under the supervision of a licensed embalmer to such student course of study such embalmings shall be counted towards the embalming requirements outlined in section 2230 when the student becomes a registered apprentice so i will reach out to frank and tell him that those 10 for the school will count towards the 50. That's that's what I was under the impression, but uh, obviously I yeah, want to go I, one step I had the old, me. the old book. This is a new revision. Um, um, Agnes, I know because um, Frank is not here. You know where they got that from? That, no. That, no. That new revision that sort of came up in our case that we heard um, about a year and a half ago. That oh, about right. Two years. So I yes. sort of feel proud. I sort of feel proud. proud that we are the ones who put that under um, the microscope and straightened it out. Thank God. 
Yeah. So I, 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 when when I went through, I sort of felt proud as you know, at least one one or two things that we done on this board actually um, came to pass. So that was great. Before we yes, close, I remember I meant, that. I meant to bring this under open form. Um, uh, Dan, uh, I want you to remember this. I reached out to the New Jersey Board of Funeral Directors and I talked, they, they connected me with somebody in their health department talking about our reciprocity agreement. Yes. So they said to me, because I know you had the names, I didn't want to bother you with, I was going to our meeting. Do we have a copy of, or the health department can find out too if they don't know, of our old reciprocity agreement that we can present to them? Well, I'll tell you, um, and, and Jeff will tell you how far back it was. We, we worked on a reciprocity agreement with um, Jennifer Philippone and Karen. And that's going back to, let me say, the year of 2001. So, so I believe we're going to have to uh, reconstruct a reciprocity agreement with the state of New Jersey. Have we ever had one? We never did. Okay. We were just at the brink of having one. And um, unfortunately, there was a change in commissioners and it wasn't executed. Now, New York, because um, I'm actually trying to get my license here, New York still requires that, you know, they can do that 12 month or the 24 month as far as schooling. But Jersey requires that four year, but they accept New York licensees. So, how can you know if they accept New York, they should be able to accept Connecticut? What do you think? I would think. I mean, we're not going into their state to open up funeral homes. What we're actually doing is we want to just, you know, with ease drive into a New Jersey cemetery and Without conduct chance. a burial. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing to say to a family that you're dealing with up in Connecticut, I'm not allowed to go into New Jersey. I have to hire a New Jersey funeral home to come into the funeral and take the funeral in the gates with me because they don't recognize my license. That is true. And I don't know, I'm just talking out loud. There are some states that can come into Connecticut, remove bodies, not be licensed in our state, have burials, but the same licensed funeral director from Connecticut can't go in their state. To me, that doesn't make sense. Sure, we anybody from Jersey, nobody stops them from coming into our no, cemeteries. Unfortunately, we have reciprocal agreements with all the New England states. They can come here and do what they want, but when we go there, you know, we got to hire a guy, pay him four or five hundred bucks to stand, sit in their car while we do a burial. That's right. That's up to the guys. That's up to the cemetery. The cemetery should be checking that. Because I can tell you this, Rose Hill does check now. Rose Hill Memorial Garden in Rocky Hill does check license. So that would be the cemetery requirements. How do you stop someone? That's true. When you go to New Jersey. I New Jersey, you sign in bodies to the cemetery. That's right. Check. You're correct. So that's what the, the cemetery is checking that, checking the requirements that are required by that. So that that's a whole separate because we don't regulate cemeteries. So how do we start this team on so we can um, get a reciprocity agreement with Jersey? We would We've have to. About this for eight years, I think. We would have to have somebody from our Department of Public Health, probably the legal entity, contact the legal entity of the Department of Public Health or the New Jersey Funeral Licensing Board to initiate a re reciprocal agreement between both states. I mean, we have reciprocal agreements with all New England states, so it'd be, you know, almost a rubber stamp of that agreement. Can we, who, Mr. Benkowski, who can we, who, who can we put on that? Or, uh, or should we go to the legal department? What, what should we do? Jeff, you got any, you got any input on that? 
because the, the old yeah, recipe uh, agreements go before I was born. Yeah, so Bob, that would have born. to go. That would have to go through Chris Andreessen. Okay, I'll, I'll bring you up to Chris then. Okay. Sure. All right. Could Chris come to our next meeting? We can invite him. Yeah, let's. Yeah, yeah, and I'll reach out to Chris too. Yeah, but I, I think we should, if if we can. I know things take time. This will probably won't happen for another five years. But if we can get this this one thing done, the funeral directors in Connecticut will be so happy to have a reciprocity agreement where we can go into Jersey. Well, then let's have Chris Andreas and actually really pursue let's it. Let's push this. Because we're not signing a death certificate. We're not moving a body. It's just basically going into the Jersey cemeteries to conduct a burial. I had a burial in Jersey, I don't know, maybe about a month ago. Person died in Jersey, had the Jersey funeral home, picked the body up, bombed the body, brought the body to me. We had a funeral. The family wanted to bury the body back in Jersey because the family was in Connecticut. So when going back into Connecticut, called the same funeral home, do charge me 500 bucks after we done gave them almost $2,000 just for an embalming and paperwork. I was, but the family paid for it, but I was saying, this is crazy. How, about, gonna, how about having uh, uh, remains come to Connecticut from New York State and having a New York funeral home move the body, we picked up the body at their funeral home and then get a phone call from the medical examiner's office down in New, Jer in New York saying they wanted the body back. <laughs> I brought the body back. They want to do a, a, a topical view. And when the guy was all through, I decided to close up the pouch and he said, where are you going? And I says, I'm going back. I just brought you the body. I'm going back because I have to get the body back to our funeral home. He said, I can't let you take it. You don't have a New York license. Shit. I had to get a New York license to come <laughs> down and sign it out. I brought him the body. Yeah. So, we all have war stories. <laughs> <laughs> Does anything, anybody have anything else to bring before we close this, this after this morning? I have one thing that I'm I'm kind of, you know, some of the states now are no longer recognizing the national board. And if you pass school, you can start your apprenticeship immediately. And I know Massachusetts has since eliminated the national board as a requirement for apprenticeship. They feel that the course content is significant enough that the board isn't needed. And and basically, I think it's going to start taking hold in some of the other states as well. And so I'm just trying to think of what your opinion may be of that. Well, I'm glad you said this because the board. This case that we had with the national board before it was just totally and utterly crazy. The national board exam, most states, which you're which you're you're 100 right, and not even accepting that national board exam, because a lot of our students, um, if if their course curriculum is right, when they come out, they should be apt enough to do their apprenticeship and take their state test. To me, and I guess when this was designed, it was for you know. A whole group of states that's you know to have a whole bunch of students who can you know by taking this one exam can also make them eligible to be licensed in other states. But I you know the national you know they went down to that 250 question um, exam for you know uh, to get licensed in the state. So I mean, it's, me, it's, it's it's my feeling. I, that unless you or I or anybody else ever has an, had or will have an interest in pursuing a license in another state, that 
you know, the course curriculum for these students to get out of school. My good Lord, it's, it, those courses down there are frightening. They are. Um, and if, if they're, they're passing the school, I don't uh, think that a national board is, is essential unless they feel that up the road they want to take this exam so that they may pursue getting a license in another state. I agree. I, I agree with you totally. You know, I think we should put that on the agenda um, to discuss this and then perhaps whatever the board feels, then we should pursue it through the legislation and see what we can do. I agree. I think it should be a choice of the student. If you're going to be licensed in more than one state, take that national board because that's going to make you, you know, eligible. To All right. Take well, the other thing, too, <laughs> is reinstituting the single license for a funeral director, because obviously, as you know, we're 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 short on manpower and should we say man and lady power? Because um, my daughter has a sign on her desk that says "Girl Boss," so uh, so I have to be fair. So, anyways, I was speaking with two of the schools, and they were willing to create a course curriculum to reflect the necessary requirements to become a knowledgeable funeral director. And I use the word knowledgeable because they would introduce some anatomy, they would introduce some chemistry, um, they would introduce what a funeral director would need not only to sit and make arrangements with the family, but also to make a safe removal of a body. And I, I think that's something we should look at. And, and one of the courses or one of the programs that I witnessed it at McAllister is yes, they wouldn't, they, they would create both a, a course and an exam that if you pass this exam, then by all means, you know, you're eligible to take the funeral director um examination in the state of connector or whatever state it is but it would be because i know i know when i was chair there was a complaint that came before us that they made arrangements with a funeral director only and the circumstances were such that the decedent died of as we all know our favorite condition is jaundice and lo and behold, it's an embalming nightmare, oh, Freda. So, so anyways, the, the circumstance was the funeral director that met with the family said, well, once our embalmer takes care of your father, he'll look his old self again. Well, Agnes, this doesn't happen. There's no such miracle with anybody who dies of a liver disease. They're yellow, they're green, and you can't clear it up. And you, you can't make them look like a mannequin in Macy's window either. So, so lo and behold, you know, the, the family walked in the room and said, you assured us that our father was going to look great. Well, you know, the guy doesn't have an overview of embalming, and you know, then, then you, you hear a funeral director goes and moves a body in my time of Kruzfeld. Well, he doesn't know that he's dealing with something that that is uh, is a dangerous case to be handling. So, he, you know, moves a body just like you'd move somebody that, you know, just died of a simple heart attack. So, you know, the schools are now reflecting course content so that when a funeral director who is just a funeral director, not a bomber, goes to a home or goes to a hospital and knows the case they know how to handle it. On uh, record, um, I would like to say, um, I'm glad this is uh, and for anybody who ever hears this, I'm 100% agreement. Connecticut should have, you could be a food director or in just an embalmer, or you can be duly licensed. Because in our community, Bodies are taboo. They'll be, they might, we have some good people. They want to go to school, but they don't want to mess with the bodies. 
So in order for them to be licensed in Connecticut, they have to, at least for, let's say, two years, two and a half years, deal with the body so they become licensed. I'm so going to interject here, guys, one second. There is a funeral director's license available in the state of Connecticut still. Okay? Yeah. Instead of doing your apprenticeship and doing 50 bodies, they register as a funeral director. They have to do 50 funerals. Now, the funeral director's licensing fee is $225 a year. They still have to go through the same curriculum that an embalmer has to go through, the schooling, pass the national board. They have to do all that. But they can be licensed as just a funeral director in the state. Okay? No. So, Daryl, you're going to pay $225 and be licensed as a funeral director or pay $115 and be licensed as an embalmer funeral director? Okay. That is, but now, there's how many funeral directors do we have in Connecticut? In the state of Connecticut, that is still available out there to people in the state if they but want many, to just be a funeral director. How many? How many? How many just funeral directors do we still have? Just funeral. I I would have to get I would have to get the numbers up. But to be a funeral director henceforth. At this point, you would need to be a funeral director in another state and transfer your license. Yes, but they have to be that their, their requirements from the other state, Dan, would have to be equal to or greater than our requirements. Right, exactly. But okay. I just like, can't like I, I said, just can't you, apply to be a funeral director in Connecticut. If no, I had, no, you so, can't no. You can no. apply to be a funeral director in Connecticut. If no, you pass exactly. the national board do the schooling, you can apply to be a funeral director. Sure. Yes. Because we had that same issue, that young man that is now the head of operations at Dover Air Force Base, he was an embalmer in the state of Connecticut, and the gov government wouldn't entertain his application because he needed a funeral director's license. And we told him at the time we didn't have a funeral director's license, but we, as a board, gave him a funeral director's license singly and an embalmer's license singly, and it qualified him to become the position that he now holds out down in Dover. That was to Caddy from Stafford. Right. Now, um, Dan, you'll remember this, and, and if this is true, um, Robert, we gave one of our funeral directors a, um, a miscarriage of justice. You remember that funeral director that was from Vermont or somewhere? He came to Connecticut. He was a licensed funeral director for like 15, 20 years. He wanted to get a job. He wanted to get a job at Brownings. So he came to us to try to get his uh, a license or a funeral director license because he wanted to move here and have a job. And we turned him down because our requirements wasn't the same when technically he could have joined in just as a funeral director. No, no. The funeral director still has the same requirements as an embalmer in the state of Connecticut. You still have the exact same requirements. The National Board two-year curriculum, you still have to do that. The only difference, Daryl, is when you register as an apprentice, you're registering as a funeral director apprentice, and you do 50 funerals in the course of a year or course of nine months. If you register as an embalmer apprentice, you do 50 embalming. Well, my thing is to that, you go into school, you take in embalming one, embalming two, micro, you take in chemistry in college to be to, for a requirement you're never going to use. Well, you are, Daryl, because Mr. Jody just said, the funeral directors are allowed to make transfers in the state. So, so you have to take you have to take these classes anyways to you're never going to use them, you're saying. But a funeral director, you know, a funeral director in the state of Connecticut can dress a body and make a transfer. OK, a funeral director can do cosmetics. OK. The only yes. thing a funeral director, if you look at the statute, says they can't do is inject fluid in the body and embalm. They can do everything an embalmer can do except the embalming. Can a funeral director? That's do why it they now? have those requirements. So they would take all the same courses at school, Daryl, 
but when it came time to get a license because they don't want to do any embalmings, they would opt to just get a single funeral director's license and they're not allowed to embalm, whereas all of us have both the dual license where we can That's do right. both. I mean, there are there are some that I'll tell you that have told me that they're only going to embalm one body That's and that right. for the examiner and they'll never touch another body in their life. <laughs> yeah, that's right. A lot of people say you know? that. And it comes yeah. back because it's a state requirement as a licensed funeral director and bomber to go to accredited mortuary school. It's right in the yeah. statute. That's why. <laughs> Definitely. Okay. So we have something on our agenda for next term, for next yeah. meeting, correct? Correct. All right, does anybody have anything else to bring before we close? Our next meeting is going to be June 9th. Um, I thank everybody um, for coming. Well, I just entertain a motion to close. So moved. All right, thank you all so much, and we'll see you on uh, June 9th. Thanks. Rob, I'm going to give you a call. Okay. And I'll get you the, um, and I'll send out the um, website stuff right away. Okay. Thanks. Nice seeing you all. Daryl, can we put those two items on the next agenda? Yeah, we're going to, we're going to put both of those on the next agenda. We just uh, said that. Look into the single license and look into the national board. Definitely. We'll definitely put that on there. Jeff, you're not going to be with us the next meeting, huh? Who's going to take your place, Jeff? I don't have an answer to that question. Hey, Jeff, all these years, it's been a pleasure. I may come yes, back. Who knows? I may come back. Jeff, it's been 20 years. We've been together up there on that board, give or take a few. Yep. I think I came on the board in 2000.